We're going to be picking it up in the 14th verse and then reading through the end uh, of the chapter. It goes like this. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory to the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, speak to us now through your word as we go through these verses and begin to talk about them and unpack them. We pray that our hearts would be tuned to your voice, that you would speak words of wisdom and insight and grace, and that we would walk out that word in our daily lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. With the conclusion of Ephesians chapter 3, we're coming really to the end of the first part of the book of Ephesians, which is separated into two parts, actually, here at the end of chapter 3. The first three chapters of Ephesians are all about the church. Paul has been talking about the church. He's been talking about what a miracle it is. <clears throat> He's been talking about the majesty of the church. He's been talking about the mystery of the church. You know, we talked last week how uh, the church doesn't appear in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets speak nothing of this period of time that you and I are in called the church age. <clears throat> and we think so weirdly about the church. To us, church is something we go to, you know. Um, I'm going to go to church. There's the church over there. I wonder if the doors are open to the church. It's so weird because, see, we're the church. The church isn't a building. It's not something we go to. The church is something we are. We are the church, capital C, body of Christ. And Paul has been talking about this mystery of the church, which in this age is this amalgamation of Jews and Gentiles who have come together as the body of Christ and are the, literally the, 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 the body of Christ to the world. In other words, the heart, the voice, the ears, the hands, the feet, and so forth uh, to the world in which uh, you know, we live. And so as we look at this last section of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is, in light of his speaking about the church, he's now going begin, to begin to pray for the church. And we're going to actually get some insights on how Paul prayed. And I think that whenever we come to a section of Scripture that deals with prayer, we should probably take note and try to learn what we can from it because let's just face it, we struggle with prayer. Um, and, and I think that's fairly universal except for those of you in the body of Christ who have a gift of prayer. You know, we're all called to pray, but there are some of you who have a special gift, and I love you guys. I mean, I really do. I, I, those of you who just, for whom praying comes easy, Oh, we need you so bad to, to encourage and help the rest of us kind of stay on task. But praying is hard. It's hard work, isn't it? If, if, if I were to put a date on the calendar and say, we're going to get together and we're going to have a prayer meeting, I would have one of the smallest groups ever. And, and I know that because I've tried it. Um, we don't come together very easily for prayer. And, you know, when, when people are go going to a Bible study, they'll want to know whether or not there's prayer during that Bible study because if there is, they probably won't come. We've had people tell us that they are not going to come to a Bible study because of prayer. Let's face it, it's hard. It's hard for all of us, right? We struggle. We're intimidated praying in front of other people. We don't want anybody to hear us praying. And we find it difficult to pray ourselves and to hold on to prayer and to persevere in prayer. It's a challenge. So Paul begins speaking to us about prayer, his prayer for the body of Christ. And we can learn some important things from this. Paul begins here by saying, uh, you know, for this reason, which is 
what he's been saying previously, all about the church, for this reason, because, in other words, because of God's purpose in creating this thing called the church, he says, I bow my knees before the Father. People ask me from time to time, is there a preferred biblical posture? Well, you know, it's interesting. You can get legalistic about it, but you see pretty much every posture in the Bible. Uh, we see people kneeling lots of times. We see uh, people standing. We see people, you know, walking and praying. Uh, you know, prayer is not something we're limited to, a one particular bodily posture. But, but kneeling is, is a powerful posture for prayer because kneeling puts us in, a, in an attitude of surrender and humility before the Lord. And, and Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, and that inner being is what is being renewed in the image of Christ, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Well, for the very first thing I want you to see here in this passage that really has nothing, well, I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with prayer. It does have something to do with prayer. But the first thing we see is the Trinity. I want you to notice here that Paul says, I kneel before the Father. Paul says, I, I'm asking that you might be strengthened by the Spirit. And then he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So you see all three persons of the Trinity right there, Father, Spirit, and Son. And not only does Paul reference all three persons of the Trinity, but he also gives us some insight into the organization and function of the individual members of the Godhead. Notice that Paul begins by saying, I bow my knees before the Father. I come to the Father. In other words, he addresses the Father in prayer. And again, this is not a legalistic thing. Again, people often ask the question, who should I pray to? Well, you know, I know there's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so who do I pray to? Well, God, remember, guys, there's only one God. There aren't two gods or three gods or five gods. There's only one God. So when you say, dear God, you're addressing all the persons of the Trinity. But the point is, there is some insight from the Word of God related to this, as Paul is giving us here, addressing the Father in the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, and so forth. But that doesn't mean that if you address Jesus, you're wrong, or if you even pray and speak to the Holy Spirit that you're wrong or that God isn't going to listen or you didn't get the formula right. God is not so much concerned about protocol as he is about relationship. Okay? So don't worry about it. But, we, you know, we see what we see here in the Word. So, we, you know, we often begin our prayers, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. This is what Paul has laid down for us here. But again, it's not a legalistic sort of a thing. But I want you to see here what Paul is saying about this reference to the indwelling presence of the Spirit. Because you'll notice that he, he, he says here, um, look at verse 16 with me again, please, in your Bible. <clears throat> Paul prays that according to the riches of the glory of God, that the Lord may grant them to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Look at verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, that's an interesting statement. But it almost sounds when you read it kind of superficially or casually like he's praying that you'd be strong enough to have Christ living in your heart. It almost sounds that way. It sounds like he's saying, you know, I'm just praying for you guys that you're strong enough to be able to have Christ dwell in your hearts by faith. But that's not what he's praying about. The issue here is not a question of having Jesus in your heart. It's a question of making sure he feels at home in your heart. You see, when we come to know Christ as our Savior, when we accept what he did for us on the cross, Jesus comes to live in our, our hearts. He comes to live in our lives. That, that happens, okay? <clears throat> what Paul is making reference here to is having Christ live there or dwell there, if you will, without any kind of grieving or any issues or feeling unwelcome. And, of course, that kind of begs the question uh, of, you know, 
What might make Jesus feel unwelcome in my heart? Well, you need to understand first a couple of things. Here, first of all, in, in, the, Greek, in the original Greek language, there were two different words that were used to describe living in something. And one of those words described living in a community or a house or a family where I am kind of a guest or a stranger, okay? The other Greek word speaks of living in a house or a town, or a country, or wherever you're, what you're living in, and living there as a permanent resident. It's interesting that Paul is using that second definition here when he speaks of the Holy Spirit, or Jesus living in you through the Holy Spirit. He's talking about him living in you as a permanent resident. And so he's saying, I'm praying for you, that you would be able, to, uh, that you'd be able to let Jesus live in your life, in your heart, as a permanent resident without issues. All right, now, what are some of those issues in my life that might make Jesus feel unwelcome? Wow, <clears throat> how much time do you have? I mean, there's all kinds of things. But what, what, what Paul is really encouraging us to do is to take inventory of our lives. And to ask myself the question, is my heart an environment where Jesus feels welcome? Or is my heart an environment that is constantly putting him at odds with my behavior, my thoughts, my actions, and that sort of thing? You know, probably one of the most beautiful prayers that we find regarding this thought process of, is my life one that is a blessing to you, God? Comes from David in the Old Testament, and it's found in the 139th Psalm. Let me put this on the screen for you so we can see it together. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. And then he said, try me, and that word try means test. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you understand what David is praying here? He's asking the Lord, is there anything going on in my life that is grieving you? Is there anything going on in my life that is grieving you in any way or causing any discomfort to you related to you living in my life? Isn't it interesting that when we think about the Holy Spirit coming to live in our life, we just assume that he has a very happy habitation. It's like, oh, Jesus lives in my heart. Hallelujah. Now let's go watch that R-rated film. But is that the habitation that you want to create where Jesus feels at home? Does Jesus feel at home living in your life with your life? You want to know what's interesting about David's prayer, the, the prayer that we just got done reading from Psalm 139? David was living in during a time when the Holy Spirit had never yet come in to live inside of a human being. You may not realize this, but in the Old Testament, God's Spirit did not indwell people, not like in the New. God's Spirit was with people, and at times when they needed His power, He came upon them, but He never came within until the New Testament took place, and Jesus first breathed on His disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So David didn't even have the indwelling of the Spirit, and yet his heart was so tender toward not wanting to grieve the presence of the Lord, he was daring enough to pray that kind of a prayer. Lord, turn on the spotlight, the searchlight of your presence, and see if there's anything going on in my life that, that you wouldn't approve of or that might in any way be grievous to you? Let me ask the question. Do we have the guts to pray that prayer? Or are we afraid that he, of the things he's going to find or make us aware of? I think that's one of the things that made David such a man after God's own heart. And he was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. David had issues in his life, believe me, and, and they're in the Bible for you and I to read. Thank God your issues aren't in the Bible for people to read. The point is, he still had the courage to come before God and say, search me, O God, test me, 
Try me and see if there's anything in my life that is grievous to you in any way. And then lead me in the way that's right, good, and everlasting. Because if there's all this stuff going in here that shouldn't be there, that's the opposite of what's good, right, and everlasting. And that's what Paul is really encouraging us to do here when he says, I'm praying for you that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. I'm praying, in other words, that you're going to live your lives in such a way that the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart is a welcoming one for him. And what that means is, I'm praying that the Lordship of Jesus Christ would extend into every aspect of your life. Yeah, even those websites that you visit when no one else is watching. I'm talking even about the thoughts that you and I think when our minds are free to think what they want. I'm talking about the way we treat one another when there's nobody else around to see how we're treating those people who are closest to us. I'm talking about the way we spend our money and the words we choose to speak to others. Are we creating an environment that is welcoming to the presence of God's Holy Spirit living in our life? Now, if you're feeling condemned, I want you to know that's not my intention, I, I, but it is the intention of the enemy, however. If, I've, if what I've been saying to you has been making you feel a little bit condemned, like, yeah, I don't think I measure up at all, join the group. None of us do. And the fact of the matter is, creating a welcoming environment for, for the, the Holy Spirit isn't always so much the issue of living this pristine life. It's responding quickly when the Holy Spirit convicts us of something in our life that isn't right. I mean, you saw what David did in Psalm 139. He said, Lord, search me and test me and try me and see if there's a problem. What do you think David's response was when God showed him about the issues in his heart? What, what was he going to do then? He was going to repent. He was going to confess. He was going to agree with the Lord, say, yeah, you, 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 boom, busted, you got me. I confess that. Do you know that confession, just saying to the Lord, yeah, that one's not good, is so welcoming to his presence. When you agree with him, when you say, Lord, this is me, this is me, and, and, and the sin that you've revealed in my life, this is me. I confess to you these things, and I need your forgiveness. You have just created an environment where he is welcome in your life. So you see, it's not about living this perfect life, but it is about learning to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit when he reveals those areas. And, and by the way, this is not an easy thing to do. And that's why Paul prays in here that you and I would be strengthened with power through his spirit so that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. Do you get that? He didn't just say, you know, I'm, just, I'm praying for you guys that you'll have the inner strength. He didn't say that. He's saying, I pray that you will have the power through the spirit to do this. Because listen, it's got to be through the spirit. The power that we have to live this Christian life, even the power to recognize our sin and confess it before God, comes through the Spirit as we yield to Him, you know? Man. When I think about my relationship with God and I think about my relationship with my kids, speaking of Father's Day again here today, I wish I would, I, 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 I look back on my past Christian life I wish I would have been faster to say I'm sorry. Both to God and my kids. I mean, I did say I'm sorry quite a bit to my kids, but I wish I would have been faster to do it. And I wish I would have been faster to do it with the Lord. I'm trying to get faster as I grow up in Him. When He reveals something to me, just to say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me for these areas these wrong attitudes, these wrong thoughts. Forgive me. Because I want, and, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm guessing you too, you do too, I want to have an environment in my heart that he's welcome to be there in, you know?
Let's take a look at the the rest of Paul's prayer here. (coughs) I'm in the middle of verse 17. Paul says that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the uh, saints what is the breadth and length and height and, and depth. You know, he's talking about the love of God. Uh, but he's using two word pictures here. One of them is the language of you gardeners or botanists, I guess, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I can't grow anything, but we do know that from the plant world, trees and that sort of stuff, that the root of a plant is vitally important because it provides nourishment. It also provides stability. You know, we've had so much windy conditions here this spring and early summer. Sometimes I'm afraid that my trees are going to topple over. But I know that they've got a root structure that goes down into the ground and it anchors them, you know, to, to the ground so that when the wind comes, they can, they, can, they can stay strong and so forth. Paul says, I pray for you that you would be rooted in the love of Christ. How far do your roots go down in the love of Christ so that when the wind and waves come around, you're not constantly doubting his love? Uh, You know, boy, after all the things going on in my life, I'm wondering if God even loves me. That's a sign that your roots don't go down far enough. And you need to be rooted more in that understanding of his love. He also talks, he uses another word picture. He says, I I pray also that you would be grounded in love. And that word grounded is uh, borrowed from building construction, and it speaks of a foundation. I pray that you would have a foundation of understanding because you see that you can, you can build on a foundation and you know that your structure is going to be stable, right? If your foundation, if you're founded on the love of God, then you're, you know, there's a, there's a stability and a strength to your understanding. And so Paul is, is praying these things and so forth for the body of Christ. And of that love, Paul prays, look at, look at verse 19, very interesting verse. Paul says, and he says, I pray for you guys to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. (laughs) Now, I want you to stop there for a moment. I want you to think about how potentially ridiculous what he just said is. I want you to know that which surpasses knowing. That's what he said. See, that's the way I used to feel about mathematics when I was in grade school. I felt like they were asking me to know something that surpassed knowledge, at least my knowledge. But it sounds kind of an interesting statement, doesn't it? But I want you to know what Paul is talking about here because when he says, I want you to know that which surpasses knowledge when he speaks of the love of Christ, he's not talking about an intellectual knowing. The word know here speaks of experiential knowledge. So what Paul is praying for, you and I, is that we would experientially know the love of Christ. He's praying, I want you to come to a place in your life where you experience the life-changing power of Christ's love. How do you like that? Not just knowing it here. I want you to know it here. And you know why Paul's praying that prayer? Because he knows that once we come face-to-face with the love of Christ and we know it experientially, it changes our lives. It literally changes our lives. And if you're sitting where you are right now here today and you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm not really sure I've ever experienced, experienced the love of Christ. I've heard a lot about it. I've read a lot about it. You know, the Bible talks a lot about his love. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Da, 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 da. You know, for God so loved the world. We, we, we run into that L word all day you know, over the place in the Bible. But maybe you're sitting there today and you're thinking, I'm not positive that I've really truly experienced that love in a life-changing sort of a way. Well, I want you to know something. I want you to know something that the enemy doesn't want you to know. It's not because God doesn't love you. See, that's the first thing the enemy comes to suggest to people when they hear about the love of Christ and they begin to ponder it and think to themselves, you know, I don't think I've ever really experienced that. The enemy is very quick to say, well, that's just simple. It's because he doesn't love you. He loves other people, but not you. I mean, other people are fairly easy to love, but you are way out there. And you are actually fundamentally beyond his ability to love. 
And the enemy would love nothing more than to sow the seeds of that lie in your heart. But I want you to know it is a lie. God loves you, but you and I have not, many of us have not experienced that life-changing love, and, and there are a lot of reasons for it. I couldn't even get into them all today. But can I encourage you, for those of you who are troubled about this, can I encourage you to make part of your regular prayer time with the Lord? Let me experience your love. Just simple as that. Lord, I want to experience your love. I want to experience what it is to be loved by you. And don't give up on that prayer, and don't get frustrated, and don't let the enemy whisper in your ear. You keep praying, you keep pressing in, and you wait on the Lord to reveal his love to you. And I'm telling you, when he does, you will be changed. It will change your entire outlook on everything. Paul ends this prayer that, that, with this beautiful doxology. <coughs> Excuse me. And he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I think this passage, particularly verse 20, has been a huge blessing and, and, and uh, encouragement to a lot of people throughout the years because it tells you and I in this verse that God is able to do even more than we could ask or think. And, and when, when you take a look at what Paul is saying here in verse 20, you begin to see this progression of, of expansion. And what I mean by that is Paul starts with a very simple thought, and that is that God is able. But he builds on that thought to the point where he keeps going outward farther and farther. And this is basically referred to as the pyramid of, of, of the promise uh, of, of this thing and what God can do. Let me put this on the screen so you can visualize it. It begins by simply saying he is able. And that's where we often begin in our walk with the Lord. He's able. And then we realize he's able to do. Okay, he can do all kinds of things. Well, like what? Well, he's able to do what we ask. Next, we have this further progression. He's able to do what we think. And then Paul goes a little bit further and he says, he's able to do all that we ask or think. And then he adds to that. He's able to do more abundantly than all we ask or think. And then finally, he is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. Do you see the progression? And do you see what Paul is trying to communicate to you and I? He's, he's, he's trying to enlarge our understanding of the power the grace and the goodness of God as it relates to prayer and when we come to him in prayer so that we would not hinder, you know, that work of the Lord by our faith being so small that we're kind of, you know, we're not even sure if God's even listening. Let alone that he's able to do abundantly, far more abundantly than all that we could ever ask or think. When you begin to get that idea in your heart and you begin to really it, it, it begins to consume you. It changes the way you pray. And the things you pray about. It's pretty amazing. But I, I, I think that even so, there might be some people who read a verse like verse 20. God is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. And they might be thinking to themselves, you know, God doesn't seem to be doing more than I could ask or think. And I want to just address that for just a moment because I think there might be two reasons for what appears to be a discrepancy between what God's Word has to say and your life. Because sometimes that happens, doesn't it? And I think the first reason for that possible discrepancy is because you and I haven't truly learned to come before the throne of grace. And what I mean by that is that, and you've heard me talk about this before, we live in this culture of convenience where we're just so accustomed to walking up to a vending machine and putting our coins in the machine, hitting the button, and out comes what we want. And we apply that same principle to God. And we've learned to be impatient, and we've learned to, to 
Well, we've, we've forgotten the whole idea of just process. Learning that there's a process to things, you know? Even to prayer. We don't really want to think about the process of prayer and waiting on the Lord, tarrying, you know, before the Lord. I want to just say my prayer and get what I want, you know? I think about the process of life that biblical characters had to deal with, you know. You and I, we're, we're hungry, you know. We, we, we go home and we're looking in the refrigerator, you know. We do, we stand there and we're looking. And it's totally empty and I don't know why we're still looking. But we're just looking. Just wasting electricity. And then we close it and say, oh, there's nothing there. And so what do we do? Well, we hop in the car, we go to a restaurant, and we either sit down and have somebody serve us, I'd like the uh, hamburger with cheese and bacon, please. Or we go to the grocery store and just pick up something quick. And even if we don't want to fix it, you know, they've got a deli there, so we can just get it ready-made, and we can be eating before we hit the car. That's our life. That's the world in which we live. Do you guys remember how the Bible talks about Remember when those three visitors came to Abraham? It was actually the Lord and a couple of angels, which I think he probably wasn't totally aware of at first. But anyway, he invited these people to stay and cool themselves under the, the tree of Mamre there, and, and he began to talk to them. And finally, he went to Sarah, his wife, and he said, Sarah, quick, go pick out a goat and slaughter it and knead some bread and bake it because we're going to have a meal with these guys. <laughs> Can you imagine? So she's got to go to the flock, you know, with, I'm assuming, one of the servants, picking uh, that one right there. Catch that one. All right, get it over here. And then we have to slaughter the thing. I'm not going to get into all the detail there. And then you've got to, you've got to clean that meat, and then you've got to you know, get it, start preparing it. And by, while that's going on, you're making bread and this thing and flour and, and stuff, and, and you putting this whole meal together, and it's a process. You see, the people in the Bible understood process. They didn't live in an instantaneous world. They understood that when you start here and you want to get here, there's a process to get there, you see? And so when it came to prayer, they applied that same understanding of life. There's a process. It's not instantaneous. There's a tarrying. There's a coming before the throne of grace and waiting there. And the process of waiting and the process of faith and the process of petition and, and, and all the things that go along with it. You know, Jesus, Jesus gave us an example of this in his life. We're told in the Gospels that he often withdrew into lonely places where he would pray. Isn't that what you read in your Bible? We're also told that when he had big decisions to make, like picking the 12 closest disciples who would then be apostles, he stayed up all night long and prayed. All night long. You ever tried to do that? Stay up all night long and pray? <laughs> I won't tell you my story. But boy, what a process that is. A lengthy process that takes, it's challenging, it's physically challenging to stay in it, to stay in the game, to, to persevere, you know, through the difficulties of, of, of that sort of thing. And then Jesus, of course, gave us parable after parable during his teaching of persevering in prayer. You can read those parables for yourself. Listen to this statement about prayer from the book of Deuteronomy. This is, this is very interesting. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. This is actually repeated as a promise by the prophet Jeremiah, who says roughly the same thing. Jeremiah chapter 29. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's a process. That's a time-involved process. That's not a quickie. That doesn't mean put your coins in the vending machine. I need that one. Good, I got it. That's the way we look at approaching God many times. And that's one of the reasons why we look at some of these promises in God's Word. You know, God is able to do abundantly, you know, more than all you could ask or think. And we think, well, it doesn't really match up to my life. 
Let me show you a passage from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I honestly think that one of the reasons we struggle to get people to pray is because we're not really convinced there's a reward at the end of that seeking time and praying time. We pray because it says we should in the Bible, but we're not really convinced about that reward. And I think the second reason that may appear uh, a discrepancy to walking out the promise of God that's here in Ephesians chapter 3 between what it says and what's going on in our lives is because we're applying our understanding to what God is doing. And that's always a recipe for futility. Uh, we lack so much understanding. I want to show you, give you an example of this. I found something on the internet this last week. It was a little meme that went like this. God is good and takes great joy in doing good to you. That's a nice thing to say. Um, I mean, and fundamentally, I think it's probably true. The problem arises when God and I disagree on the definition of good. And that happens quite frequently in my life. He promises me that he will work all things together for good in my life, right? I just disagree with him on what good means because he's working good and it looks to me like it's anything but. In fact, it looks to me that it's actually bad. And so what you see I'm trying to do is I'm trying to interpret the purposes and, and, and the will of God and the, and the goodness of God through my own understanding. And my understanding falls so incredibly short. And then there's that troubling passage in Isaiah 55. Man, I run into this every so often, and, and I'm reminded that God tells me that his thoughts are not my thoughts. He says, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I read that, and I'm kind of reminded again, oh, yeah. And you see, here's the problem. I'm not taking that into consideration. And I'm judging what God is doing in my life according to my thoughts and my understanding. And so what I end up doing is I end up judging him according to my understanding, which is incredibly limited. I found another, and this is an amazing statement that's in that same chapter of Isaiah. Check this out. This is a word from the Lord. He says, incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And the reason I think that's significant is because what the Lord is telling you and I to do in that passage is to incline our ear to his voice. You see, because when I come into the place of prayer and I start asking things from God, my ear is inclined to my voice. Or even possibly the voice of the world. And that's going to be an exercise in futility almost every time I go to pray. So the Lord speaks to me and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to incline your ear to my voice and then begin to hear. And you're going to find that it's going to be life to your soul. Because when we come to God with our ears tuned to our own voice, then basically it's my demands that are on the table. It's my will that is on the table. It's my desire that I'm laying before the Lord. God, here's what I want you to do. And the Lord says, when you come to me, incline your ear to my voice. Wouldn't it be something if we began our prayers without asking a single solitary thing of God, but simply coming to him and saying, Lord, incline my ear, tune my ear, to your voice. And I'm not going to ask one single thing of you until I know that my ear and your voice are in sync and I'm hearing you because then I'm going to be able to have a conversation with you without frustration. 